it's that time of year again where I rank all the animated movies I've watched the previous year from worst to best. 2023 was a very divisive year for animation for me. When the bangers came out, they really banged, and everything else either felt mediocre or was flat out bad last year. Now unlike the 2022 list where none of the worst infuriated me to the point of rage, I cannot say the same thing about 2023's ranking. In fact, I intentionally didn't review my worst of the worst because there was simply nothing to talk about with those movies. We'll get there when we get there. This year, I sort of stretched what counted for the purpose of this list, and you'll see what I mean by that while watching this ranking play out. There's spoilers up ahead for these movies, so either skip over the ones you haven't seen but don't want to, please do this, or just don't watch altogether. I know a lot of you are probably thinking right now, a bad year for animation? Nonsense! We had shit like Spider-Verse and Mario come out, so how could this year possibly be bad? Well, I'm about to show you how, at least for me, was a very interesting year, and can't wait to see this list play out. That being said, let's get started with the worst of the worst before making our way up to the good stuff. The total animated movies I saw was 36 this year, so let's get started. However, before we do, I want to say, since this was such a big year for animation, I decided to make this video bigger and give friends of mine cameos and they get to talk about a movie for around a minute. These cameos will not reflect my overall ranking, and most of them don't know where I place some of the movies, so their opinion may differ from mine. Now for real, let's begin. <laughs> Inspector Sun came out the same week as the Five Nights at Freddy's movie, so it was doomed to fail from the start. However, contrary to what critics say about the FNAF movie, I actually enjoyed it enough to call it a good movie. I cannot say the same thing for this piece of shit, which rightfully earned its box office bomb, along with the rest of Viva Kids' filmography. These guys, in my opinion, are worse than Illumination, and I don't even hate that studio that much. Their website says, Unforgettable Adventures on the big screen, but hell, I can't find a single kid who would enjoy their movies, because they are so damn awful. They released three movies this year, and we will get to them. But let's start with Inspector Sun, The Curse of the Black Widow, which I find to be the worst of the three. This movie was around 80 minutes long, and it felt like three hours long. It's about this narcissist named Inspector Sun who wants to take credit for a sting operation gone wrong, causing him to lose his job. However, he's sent to take a vacation, and a murder happens on board the plane, and he has to figure out who done it. When I first heard this, I was intrigued, because I love a good murder mystery. Hell, I ranked the Bob's Burgers movie as the top spot on the previous year's ranking, this, however, is so god-awful, so insufferable, it gave me a headache watching this. Yes, it's that awful. The dubbing on this is horrendous, and every single character here will get on your n n nerves. Fuck, I can't talk. Anyways, by the way, Mr. Detective, IT'S YOUR FUCKING FAULT! THE GUY GOT MURDERED BECAUSE YOU DIDN'T WANT TO PROTECT HIM WHEN HE CLEARLY STATED TO YOU HE WAS IN DANGER OF BEING ASSASSINATED! Oh, and the fan of Inspector's son, who I can't bother to remember the name of, was obnoxious. I couldn't stand her one bit. Both the main characters are fucking insufferable. Oh, and when we get to the actual mystery of this, it's not even within the last parts of the movie. And when we do figure out the culprit, the movie tries to tie everything together at once from every scene. And it's not even interesting. It's so boring! This movie makes me so fucking mad. So angry. It's agonizingly painful to watch. There is a scene where one of the flies eats literal shit. The humor is so dry. I hate this movie! I hate this movie! I hate this movie! Did I mention I hate this movie yet? Cause I fucking do! Nothing works, and I don't see how this movie was good enough to be put up in theaters. Cause it's so fucking awful! The setup of this murder mystery could have worked in some way. But this movie is an example of what not to do with a premise like this. And if you want a good murder mystery from last year, it's not animated, but go watch Scream 6 instead. This movie is a worthless waste of your time. And the only thing I enjoyed about it was when it ended, that, and my popcorn. Guys, I think we should all sit down and watch a good movie today. Okay. Yeah, but what should we watch? Gore. Uh, I don't know about that one, Chief. 
just watch the Drake movie. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Watch Funky. Yeah, I think you just made somebody leave, bro. No. <laughs> What a surprise! Another Viva Kids movie ranked in this spot. I was bouncing back and forth on whether or not I should rank Rally Road Racers or Inspector Sun in the bottom spot, but there was one thing Rally Road Racers had that Inspector Sun didn't. It didn't make me feel angry, bored, and have a headache at the same time. In fact, Rally Road Racers only made me feel bored and angry. Let me explain. There is literally NOTHING, and I mean NOTHING, to talk about with this movie. It is the most bland thing I've watched last year. The movie is about as cliche of an animated movie as you can get. Kind of like the Emoji movie, but maybe not as infuriating. It hits all the beats of a standard animated feature, trying to check off every box it can for a typical animated movie. This film is about Gene, at least I think that's his name, I don't give a fuck, who aspires to be a racer, but he isn't good enough and this guy wants to flood his village. And the two make a deal stating that if he wins, he'll flood the village, if not, that he won't. By the way, the villain in this movie is the world's greatest racer of all time, and he has a fucking rap song that made my ears ugh, bleed. God, I don't want to hear that shit ever again. Anyway, I want you to take the time to think of how this movie would go. Because it's by the producer of Shrek, and it seems like it's trying to be like Kung Fu Panda or something. Rest assured, I promise you, it is neither of those things. It is painfully generic. And while predictable movies aren't all bad, it depends on how they're executed. For example, take the bad guys. The movie was formulaic, but its characters and actions on the screen were fun to watch, despite also being predictable. Oh yeah. I forgot to mention, there's a pregnant seahorse for some reason, but he doesn't add anything to the story and his whole jokes are just about him being pregnant. Yes! Male seahorses are the ones to give birth! We get it! Now, please, for the love of God, shut the fuck up! If I described this movie, it would just be like every other animated movie I'd be describing, but it makes me appreciate the movies that are predictable and still manage to find charm and heart in them. This one, just utterly and hilariously fails to achieve that in every single way. <laughs> Despite never watching the series, I was honestly looking forward to watching this movie. Though I've heard from many that season one is the only good thing to come from this show, I've considered watching it out of curiosity. This movie, however, managed to make me mad, and it looks like it's setting up a sequel, I'm not sure. Psychopath's Providence is definitely a movie, but it's so confused on what it wants to be. The writers need to get their shit together with this one. Because this, this was just awful. Now, what's this movie about? I couldn't tell you what it's about because the film is all over the place. There's like four or five plots going on and I couldn't name a single one for you aside from the fact that this is a crime thriller. The villain in this movie is so fucking stupid. He has who I think is the main character at gunpoint and almost shoots her, but he just keeps rambling his mouth and doesn't shut up. You have the opportunity right there to kill her and get away with everything. Just do it! Of course he doesn't, because, you know, plot. If there even is any and gets killed. You might be thinking, oh, you've never watched the show, so of course you're not going to like this movie. Motherfucker, I watched both Dragon Ball Super Superhero and One Piece Film Red and don't know nothing about those shows. I enjoyed both of them and had a fun time. Psychopaths Providence doesn't get that luxury. Fans, at my screening at least, also didn't like the movie. So it's not a me problem. This movie got on my nerves, but unlike the last two, I could say it wasn't exactly boring, but kind of was. It made me frustrated though because of how confusing its plot was. I might rewatch it after I watch the show and see if my thoughts are still the same. I'll make a follow-up review if or when I do that. Hilarious and original! <laughs> Warrior King was hilariously bad. So bad, in fact, the animation looks like Overwatch models. I'm gonna keep the segment short because the movie was so bad it was good. 
It came from China, and for some reason there was like five minutes of opening credits. The movie isn't good. I was the only one in the theater for this movie, and I decided afterwards to go watch Coraline in theaters since it was rerunning and hadn't seen it since I was six years old. I enjoyed it. Lesson of today, don't watch any of these movies I've listed so far. Down, I'm trying to be boring. If you want a movie that's just a history lesson or feels like a movie the teacher in class would put on because they didn't feel like teaching, The Inventor is for you. Its animation is good and I like the 2D segments plus stop motion. Good job there. But unfortunately, that's where my positives end for this movie. It's so boring and so dull. It's not even as imaginative as it claims. Want a good stop motion movie that's actually imaginative and fun? Go watch Wallace and Gromit The Curse of the Were-Rabbit. The movie tells the story of Leonardo da Vinci, and I think we can agree that most movies designed to be historical usually never work. Movies people point to when one does work, however, is The Prince of Egypt, which is a really good movie. Damn, I've mentioned DreamWorks movies a lot in this ranking. But anyway, another bad example would be Disney's Pocahontas because of how inaccurate that story is. If you want to know more, just watch my review, because I'm already bored talking about this movie. But it seems others like this film, but... I just don't. Stop it. Get some help. Ah, uh, yes. Our first mainline Western animation studio movie of the list. The worst one this year, at least to me, was Trolls Band Together. Let me start by saying, DreamWorks, what happened, man? You put out two bangers last year and then went on to put out a mid-movie and a very not good one. I went on opening night with a friend, and I saw reviews prior saying that this was the most watchable Trolls movie, and I disagree, because this, in my opinion, is the worst of the trilogy. I heard we're getting a Trolls 4, and I am not at all excited for that. The first Trolls was decent enough, and the second was okay, so I predicted I'd not like the third one, and, funny enough, I was right. This movie follows Branch as the film's lead this time, and boy, is this Trolls Endgame, because we get several references from the first movie, and a little bit of the second, the second lacked in continuing the story onward in some ways is this movie. We finally see where the Bergens are. We also get a reference to the scene where singing killed Branch's grandma. I'll list a few of my positives. First of all, the soundtrack is really good. I always look forward to the Trolls movie's soundtracks, because usually, I end up liking them enough. Branch also had a good arc here, I'll admit, and some elements of the film kinda worked, but I still didn't really like the overall film. It picks up a bit in the climax, but... Not by much. It's not enough to save the whole movie. The villains of this movie are very cringeworthy, and I really, really could not stand the egomaniac that was John Dory. Would I say it's watchable? Maybe to some degree. But the movie's pacing was way too slow for me. Kids will probably like it because of the colors. Oh, and did I mention there's 2D animated segments? While I can't call this movie completely bad, I still don't like it, but it's not the worst DreamWorks movie out there. However, my friend Tyler, who I saw the movie with, is going to state how he felt when watching this movie with me. Okay, cool. Hello. I was asked by my friend Liam to give my feelings on Trolls 3, which was a movie that he and I went to go see together. This picture here is proof that we went to go see it. It was okay. I mean, I wasn't really a fan of some of the songs they picked, but I mean, it doesn't really surprise me. And it's kind of sort of just an okay film. I mean, it's not the best thing DreamWorks has done, but it's, it's okay. And there's a lot of... I mean, it's my favorite film of all time. I love it so much. Please don't hurt me, Justin Timberlake. Please. Please. That's what I thought. I'll see you later, punk. The Monkey King has some really good animation. 
I'll give it that much. But honestly, I had a hard time getting into its story. Like, all the pieces are there for it to be a good movie, but its characters are so uninteresting, and I really couldn't stand the Monkey King himself. At least it had a cool villain, but honestly, there's a much better villain with a similar motive and plan, that being Superfly from TMNT, which we will get to later on. But overall, I couldn't find myself enjoying this one too much, and I forgot most of what I watched at the end of it anyway. So, we're honestly just gonna move on. Old Maurice, hmm? The first Viva Kids movie this year, The Amazing Maurice, in my opinion, is honestly just harmless. But I thought it was very mediocre. I'm not a fan of the animation in the movie, and its plot left me confused. It's very meta for some reason, as the narrator telling the story is also in the story, and treats the current plot as if it's an actual movie. Which, I mean it is, but if you've seen the movie, you'll get what I'm trying to say. I don't really remember the film's plot off the top of my head, but my review on this film may tell you a thing or two, or give you an idea of the movie. I ain't hate it by all means, that's about all I can say. It's mediocre and that's it. Yeah, not much else to say. Just go watch my separate review on it if you really want to. It's on YouTube somewhere up. Predictable. I know this movie has a cult following online, and most definitely has its fans. I unfortunately am not one of those fans. I really don't see how anyone who previously saw the trailer could enjoy this movie. If you've seen the trailer, you've seen the entire movie. I will say this, however. Ruby Gilman Teenage Kraken did not deserve to be DreamWorks' biggest opening weekend flop. But thank God it earned more money than the shit show that was Spirit Untamed. However, let's get into what I liked first. I liked its animation. It does get creative at times on how things are presented, and I thought that was cool. The characters are good as well. However, for every one thing it gets right, it unfortunately gets five other things wrong. The story is pretty basic, and the trailer, as I said, tells you the entire thing. It's an outcast story where Ruby has to hide the fact she's a kraken and not a human. Though that should be obvious based on how everyone around her looks normal, except for her crush. This movie could have been something pretty decent. If only they explored the concept of a war between krakens and mermaids more. I want to know more about that! Not the obviously evil mermaid manipulating Ruby into helping her genocide against the Krakens. It really sucks this film's story is generic, because I really was left bored watching everything play out on screen, because I knew what would happen. The characters are good, I like them okay, but they honestly weren't enough to carry this movie. And I don't know if they were trying to make Chelsea a twist villain, but we really don't get to see her do anything truly evil until the third act. She's just a high school bully throughout most of the movie, it does have an interesting climax, but too bad the trailer already spoiled that. I also mentioned in my review how making her a twist villain wouldn't work if that was the intent, because the movie gives us the information that mermaids are evil. So, no. I should save more of my thoughts for my upcoming DreamWorks ranking, which I still am marathoning all of the movies right now. DreamWorks, this really wasn't your year, man. I mean, it's alright, like... I ain't hate it. I ain't hate it! Yeah, one of my all-time favorite Disney movies got a live-action remake, and I thought the story would be butchered to death, but no, here it is. However, things were changed probably for the better, if you know, you know. Some things in the movie hilariously contradict Neverland, like the fact that there's this one scene where all the pirates say no children in Neverland, but it's a place where you can't grow up, so wouldn't they technically be kids? There was nothing I could find offensive, but I still didn't exactly like it either. It is one of the better live-action remakes, I guess, but that's not a high bar, is it? This one doesn't go out of its way to ruin your childhood like others do. And I also wasn't a fan of giving Captain Hook a tragic backstory, which, he was one of the most fun parts of the original movie. He's just kind of whatever here, but it is what it is. It's not as bad as Pinocchio or Aladdin in terms of how these live-action remakes go. Probably won't watch it ever again, and I do agree with issues people have with this movie, but I don't think it's one of the worst live-action remakes out there. Just go watch Hook instead, man, if you want a live-action Peter Pan. Welcome to the internet! Have now, you may have noticed something. In my 2021 ranking, I didn't rank the original movie. That was because I had only seen it weeks before I watched the sequel to Sword Art Online Progressive. I was told I could watch these movies without knowing shit about the show, so I did just that. I liked the first movie. I thought it was fun, and kept noobs, who are new to the franchise, up to speed. The second movie, however, I thought was just... 
okay. Nothing more, nothing less. I know these movies are from Asuna's perspective. It is the only difference from the show as Kiriko is the main character, for those of you left in the dark. I'll break the series down for you as someone whose only experience with Sword Art Online are these two movies. Here we go. From what I understand, this dude developed a game called Sword Art Online and trapped hundreds of players into the game. And whoever makes it to the end and defeats the final boss gets to go home. From what my friends have told me, Season 1's okay, but they fuck it up by making the final boss come early or something. Season 2 is awful, and Season 3 is the peak of this series. Anyway, this movie takes place on Floor 5, and I think there's 100 floors total of the game. From what I know, these progressive movies are going to show every floor and f are here to fix the original Sword Art Online. I'll watch all the movies as they come out, or I assume the next one will be released next year or 2025. And by next year, I mean 2024. Fuck me. Anyway, yeah, we'll just wait and see, I guess. I'm not gonna blabber about Tsurune the movie much. Just know KyoAni is my fave animation studio. But this movie was just a recap of the first season. That's the whole movie with some anime original scenes. That's it. Moving on. Wow. An actually kind of okay animated Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie from Disney. That's not saying much as the best in this trilogy so far, but I'll take what I can get from this. This time, Greg and Rally destroy a snowplow and are now wanted for the crime. Meanwhile, Greg has to keep himself on the nice list to get a gaming system he wants, while doing so in fear of being watched by this elf on the shelf knockoff. I watched this as soon as I got home from watching The Boy and the Heron, which we will get to later on, but honestly, some of the jokes in this kind of made me chuckle. The scenes from the original book are still intact, and nothing feels too jarring or too fast-paced. Yeah, I can actually kind of appreciate the stakes here. They are low, obviously, it's fucking Diary of a Wimpy Kid, but the previous two lacked any sort of real stakes, in my opinion. These movies just keep getting better and better, and hope the quality ups itself every installment. Before we move on, though, I decide to save this for the very end. I find it very funny that... okay. Anyone who's under the age of 13, look away from the screen or cover your ears because you aren't ready to hear this. Just wait for the next movie to pop on screen, I guess. We ready? Okay. I find it very funny that parents complained about this and told kids not to watch it because it spoils the fact Santa isn't real. Which is true, but hey, it's still funny to me. Now, is that Disney enough for you? Oh, you just did it! My opinion on Lonely Castle in the Mirror is very... divisive. What do I mean by this? The movie had a really good setup that I got into. Kids who were bullied have access to another world via mirrors and have to be home by 5pm, or else all the kids in the castle get eaten by a wolf. Now, you might be asking what their goal is, and I'll tell you, to get a key to a room which grants them one wish. Now, let's be real, we all knew Ko Kokoro was gonna win the wish because she's the main character. Once I heard the plot, I knew that going into it, and I wasn't particularly mad about that. The first two acts of the movie were so good, but then we get to the climax, and it's a Disney ass ending! Whoop de doo! All that build up for this! Let me explain. The movie decides to cheat when all the kids get eaten by the wolf because one of the kids didn't return home. All of them except Kokoro die. And the reasoning is that she didn't enter the castle that day. The movie never establishes that if you don't enter the castle on that day. You don't suffer the fate if all the kids don't return home. Not once did the movie mention this, and it feels like a cheat. Or maybe they did establish this and I missed it. But I was very attentive during the movie. They could have made the Red Riding Hood wolf lady the film's antagonist and up the overall stakes, but I'm not complaining there. So what makes this Disney-ass ending, you ask? Well, there are no rules for what you can't wish for, and Kokoro was gonna wish to no longer be bullied. But the scene after the kids die, she gets the key and wishes everyone to be back to life! The ending of this movie is what made me angry, but I couldn't possibly place it anywhere else, since I really enjoyed the first two acts. Maybe the movie could have set more rules? At least when Aladdin got the genie out of the bottle, there were still rules involved. Here? Nope. This also implies Kokoro could have wished for more wishes if she wanted to, and she wishes the kids to be back to life and to not be bullied. Everything's all okay by the end. The sending nearly destroyed the entire movie, and then it drags out for another 10 to 15 minutes. I would rewatch this movie up until the point where she wishes everyone back to life, because it's actually good and entertaining, but after that, it's a snooze fest from here, and will maybe infuriate you as much as it did me.
Not bad. Not bad. Shockingly, I really enjoyed the live-action version of The Little Mermaid. Nothing really hurt the story, it was still the same, and I'd argue it's definitely one of my favorite live-action remakes from Disney. That's not a very high bar, but congrats, Disney. You didn't completely fuck up a classic movie for once. However, I don't like King Triton's acting, and I don't like how the animals look in this movie. Ariel was definitely the best part of this movie, though. And there's only one song they managed to fuck up for me, that being Kiss the Girl, if you wanted to know. The new songs range from fine to okay, and I like how they made Prince Eric more of a character here. Some of the new stuff actually has some improvements over the original. I'm not saying this is better, but hey, I liked it enough. Leave me alone, okay? Your childhood's safe with this one. Hop off my ass. <laughs> Kinda embarrassing how this one is as high as it is, but it really is better than all the other movies so far. I also give it a bit of slack because at the end of the day, it is based on a preschool show, so I'll review this from the standpoint of I'm a parent taking my child to see this movie. I liked it enough. Just like the last movie, it deals with another heavy theme for Paw Patrol, anyway. Where the last one dealt with anxiety and facing your fears, this one deals with feeling insignificant. Which I didn't expect from Paw Patrol. You're Paw Patrol! Why the fuck are you trying?! I'm not gonna pretend this one's a favorite of mine. It isn't. But I do like the character arc Sky goes through. And the film's main thread is a fun character. I also like the fact they make fun of Hollywood in a scene, which is one of the last things I expected from Paw Patrol. I've noticed online people have been kinda harsh toward this film, and quite frankly, I don't see why. It's a harmless movie, and it's not like it's telling your kid to go put yourself in danger or something. Yes, at the end of the day, Paw Patrol is a preschool show, and I'm choosing to review this movie differently than I would with others. I believe parents will have a good time, and kids will eat this movie up. The ones at my screening certainly did. And yeah, overall, it was a fun movie. Nothing more to be said. However, I have Isaac Carthy on to see if he thinks the same way I do. Take it away, ma'am. As perhaps the most well-documented hater of Paw Patrol the movie, I had very little hope in its sequel, The Mighty Movie. But to my surprise, it ended up being better than its predecessor. That's not to say I liked it, though, as the writing was still as safe and boring as possible, a bunch of stuff could be cut without changing the outcomes of certain events, and the message, while well-intentioned, feels a bit clumsy in its execution. And that's not even including how a good majority of the prominently credited celebrities only get, like, one or two lines max. But I want to give Paw Patrol the Mighty Movie some credit where credit is due. The animation is okay with there being some solid action scenes, the villains are entertaining, and Learning to Fly is a genuinely beautiful song. As it stands, however, Paw Patrol the Mighty Movie may not have been as bad as some of the other animated movies we got last year like The Monkey King, Trolls Band Together, or whatever the hell is going on with Viva Kids, but it's still a generic and unremarkable kids film with not a whole lot to write home about. Alright, I'm gonna hand it back to OMC now before I get a bomb delivered to my house. If you want to see more videos of me talking about movies, shows, or whatever else I feel like, then subscribe to the Isaac Carthy YouTube channel. Glad I could be here. I am not a Digimon fan, but I also enjoyed this movie enough. I liked it, and I like its predecessor. I got a few audience reactions when I went out to watch it, and I can safely say I had a good time. Digimon fans probably will love it more than me, but that's a given. Our heroes meet a boy who claims to be the first Digi-destined ever, and a Digimon appears in the real world who wants everyone to have a Digimon partner. The movie did get a few laughs out of me, but personally, I think I enjoyed the first one a bit more. I'm sorry, I don't have a lot to say about this one. So here's some audience reaction clips I got instead. That was easy. A Chicken Run sequel hit Netflix, and I enjoyed it. It builds off more from the last one, and Ginger and Rocky having a kid seems fitting. Usually stuff like this doesn't work in media, but here, it does. Ginger's afraid of going to the outside world, which makes sense given how the last movie was like a prison escape from Miss Tweety, who actually returns for the second movie. This time, she wants to get revenge on all chicken kind and turn them into chicken nuggets, and the way she does this is pretty terrifying, I'm not gonna lie. She brainwashes the chickens into making them want to be killed. The animation is better here, and, while well, not to say the original is bad, it has the record for the biggest box office success for stop-motion movies for a reason, the animation's just better here. I don't know if, overall, I can call this film better than the original. Both are on the same level of quality in my opinion, and that's not a bad thing. I had a fun time with this movie, and to me, that's all it needed to satisfy. 
However, I got a special guest here who worked on Coyote vs. Acme on to talk more about the movie. Give it up for Steven Rayburn! Spoiler free review for Chicken Run 2, Dawn of the Nugget. I'm going to put it very simply. I loved the first one. Came out over 20 years ago. Great voice acting. Great plot. Great story. It was something fresh, something new. It was really, really great. Uh, this one, you know, I mean, it comes out 20 years later. And they, you know, they're, they're on a different place now. A safe place, but then there's trouble again. And it just kind of feels repetitive. Um, I mean, they tried to bring a new twist to it. But then there's different voice actors in it as well. And you can feel it. You don't connect with them as much. But think of think of it this way. You know, if you liked Chicken Run 1, you'll like this movie, but you won't love it, if that makes sense. So basically what I mean is if you love Chicken Run 1, you probably won't love this one. You might like it just because of the nostalgic feel, but you lose a little bit of that with the different voice actors. Um, so overall, I give it maybe a, maybe a 5 out of 10. You know, watch it. Have some fun with it, I guess. But overall, I... I probably won't watch it again. That's just my honest review on Chicken Run 2. We must save a chickens later. Better than most. Better I did not see a point in reviewing Migration, simply because it was released at the end of the year, so everything I could say about it just could be said here. So that's what we're doing. Illumination actually being better than DreamWorks this year was a pleasant surprise. Migration follows a family of ducks looking to relocate and explore the world. Their father, Mac, goes through a similar character arc of Marlin from Finding Nemo. The movie is kind of like Finding Nemo in that regard, but it does a lot differently to stand out. The humor in this movie is good. I chuckled a few times throughout the movie, and I had a good time watching it on top of that. All the characters are likable, from Mac, who I said is similar to Marlin from Finding Nemo, Pam, who is an optimistic and outgoing mother, Dak, who is the oldest of the kids, Gwen, who just wants to explore the outside world just like the rest of her family, and Uncle Dan, who is personally my favorite character in the movie due to his comedy. Aquafina's character was also a treat, and another funny one at that. Now, the movie didn't really need a villain, but we have one regardless in the form of Chef. And no, not from Trolls. Chef is kinda like Gordon Ramsay. He cooks birds into his meals and wants to hunt down the Mallard family to cook them into food also. He didn't really need to be here, and as much as I love animated movie villains, this one felt unnecessary for some reason. You could take him out, and the only thing that wouldn't happen would be the film's climax. But that's about it. Overall, though, I really enjoyed Migration. It's another step in the right direction for the studio, and I hope Despicable Me 4 will be a good one. <laughs> this movie was good. That time I got reincarnated as a slime Scarlet Bond was the first movie I watched in theaters last year. I honestly don't have much to say about it other than Shion is awesome, and I was sad when Hiro died. It's not canon to the anime, but it is an adventure fans don't want to miss out on. The thing that got me the most about this movie was the way it ended with my favorite character, Malim. She's always a joy to watch. And season 3 is airing right now, and I've been watching it, and cannot wait to see what holds next for Rimaru's journey. That's nasty. This crude comedy was a fun time. I've seen a lot of mixed reviews about the movie, but I personally thought it was funny. Strays follows Reggie, who lives with this guy named Doug, who isn't a very good owner to him. One day he decides to abandon him, and Reggie wants to find his way home. He then meets other stray dogs who teach him the life of being a stray, and they decide to get revenge on Doug by biting his something I probably can't say in this video. Otherwise, YouTube would probably just restrict this. Anyway, it sounds like a fun premise, but I have some issues. Sometimes the humor is a bit too reliant on the crude elements of the film, but that's not my big issue. My biggest issue is them doing a third act breakup, and this, or Elemental, probably serves as the most pointless third act breakup of last year. I can't decide which one was worse, but both of them annoyed me, and this one just really took me out of the film. Some moments I liked, though, were when the dog was narrating and when the dogs were on shrooms ripping up rabbits. I could maybe forgive the third act breakup if they established Reggie did want to improve himself for Doug, but this wasn't even established at all. It came out of nowhere. Reggie just wants to be called a good boy, and Will Ferrell does a good job on his performance. 
Same with Jamie Foxx, who voices Bug. Yeah, this movie was good, but not perfect by all means. When it was released digitally, though, I decided to make a few of my friends watch this movie. It was a fun time, but my friend Carson here has some thoughts about it. Strays is a movie about a dog named Reggie who, after coming to the realization that his abusive owner doesn't give a damn about him, teams up with a group of other stray dogs to bite the guy's dick off. While I didn't mind the movie's plot, its over-reliance and shock value through its explicit comedy revolving around dogs, and excessive shitting killed my enjoyment. I'm unsure of how the others felt uh, about this type of crude humor, but honestly I was pretty disgusted. Uh, despite my heavy criticism of its humor, uh, I think Will Ferrell and Jamie Foxx did an excellent job. An amazing job, actually. I think they carried this movie, and they're the only reason I'm giving this movie a 3 out of 10. However, they also have starred in better movies, and I think you should just watch those instead. Hey, that's pretty good! Oh yeah, this is the movie Paramount actively sabotaged. Seriously, is this going to be a trend for studios? Because I'm not down for this. Disney did this to Strange World, Universal did this to Ruby Gilman, and Under the Boardwalk really didn't deserve it. Granted, no movie deserves it, because artists and talented animators work very hard on these films, plus everybody else behind the movie. And sure, their quality may not be up to snuff with the studio's previous works in the past, this goes for all three of them, but it still doesn't excuse it. Anyway, this rom-com was pretty good. It follows Armin and Ramona. Two crabs from opposite races trying to get together. Kind of like another animated movie that came out earlier last year. Anyway, it was fun! I like the characters, even if they aren't the most complex characters you'll find in an animated movie. I'm glad the message it has isn't sugar-coated. Although, I agree, Elemental does this message better. The setting, while confined to one area, feels big for its characters, and I'm perfectly fine with that. They even detail the beach and have locations for the crabs, like their own mini New Jersey. This should have gotten a more wide theatrical release. Hell, you released this, like, Inspector Sun, the same weekend as the Five Nights at Freddy's movie, in like 50 theaters. Of course it was gonna do bad. What'd you expect? Oh right, Paramount doesn't want to give original ideas in theaters a chance. Why? People are gonna get tired of, like, the 45th Spongebob movie or some shit. Come on, you could have released Tiger's Apprentice in theaters. But that weekend I saw some shit in theaters called Jungle Bunch Operation Meltdown. Like, I wasn't even excited to see that. And surprise, surprise, it's not a good movie. Luckily, I had Orion in the Dark and Tiger's Apprentice to watch that weekend anyway. But you've seen my review on Orion by now, and I thought Tiger's Apprentice was just mid. Anyways, the songs in Under the Boardwalk are good as well, especially Line in the Sand, which is my favorite song in the movie. And it's got a deaf character in it as well. How many times have we seen those in animated movies? Name one deaf character you know of in an animated film. Go on. I'm waiting. You can't, can't you? The movie does have flaws, unfortunately, that I cannot overlook. Like, the songs do use noticeable auto-tune, and it does do some typical animated movie stuff, and some things felt like they were there to add more suspense to the climax that just didn't need to be there. Unless this is like your first animated movie you've ever watched, these may not be issues for you, but they were for me. Anyway, go support it and go against what Paramount has said about it. I enjoyed Leo. It may be an Adam Sandler film and like, no one heard about it until closer to release, but it was a good movie. It follows a lizard named Leo and a turtle named Squirtle, and no, not the Pokemon, who are in an elementary school classroom every year. However, Leo starts to worry that when he turns 75, he will die and wants to live his last year meaningfully. When a new substitute comes in that the kids hate due to her tyranny, she makes the class more responsible as the class take home the animals every weekend. With each student getting a turn, Leo used this as an opportunity to help the kids win a trip to a theme park as a prize. The kids learn from Leo and the film is semi-musical, but I'm gonna be honest, I forgot all the songs by the time the movie was over. Which I don't know why this even needed to be a musical. You could have taken the songs out and the message of the film would still be the same. Anyway, yeah, it's a great film. Better than I even expected. The only gripe I have is I'm not a fan of how the humans look in this movie, but the way the animals look is nice. But yeah, go watch it. It's spherical! <laughs> yeah, I watched Craig of the Creek. It's a good show and gives me recess vibes. When I first started the show, I just couldn't put it down because of how imaginative it is. 
And the movie definitely carries that over, but maybe not as much. The movie is a prequel to the show. Craig and his family move into a neighborhood, and it shows how he met both Kelsey and JP. It does have references to the show, but it is very much beginner-friendly. I would show this to people who aren't fans of the show. It follows Craig and company going against the pirate kids and its captain, Serena. Craig finds a thing in his new home and finds out something called the Wishmaker exists, and he wants to find it and go back to his new home, but has a run-in with the pirate kids, whose captain wants to flood the creek and go back home. We learn more about Serena as the movie goes on. She has a sympathetic backstory that I won't talk about here, but is similar to that of Craig's in the movie. I must also mention she has a really good villain song. I didn't think songs would show up in this film, but the animation just goes hard on it for no reason, but it shows up. Overall, a really solid film. And the only reason it's not higher is the facts I like the other movies more. That is all. <laughs> I really enjoyed Blue Giant. If I had to describe it, I'd say it's a gift that kept on giving. The animation goes really hard with the jazz sequences here. Some deplorable CGI pops up here and there, but it honestly didn't hurt the overall story. I enjoyed this one quite a bit. It may not be like, I don't know, soul level good, but I still had a great time. Dai has a good character arc of wanting to achieve his goal of being a great saxophone player, and no matter how many times he failed, he got back up and tried again. While it may not be a literal blue giant, it satisfied me, and I am glad I saw this on the big screen. I have never seen a single episode of the show. That being said, I really enjoyed this movie. It was pretty emotional, and I did end up tearing up during some scenes of the film. It does adapt some of the manga and is a canon movie, but I felt like I didn't miss a whole lot when watching it. I was able to understand everything pretty well. This is an example of how to make a CGI anime. Please, if you want to make a CGI anime movie, um, Japanese anime studios, please take notes from the first slam dunk. However, I think I am more of a fan of how Dragon Ball did it in their recent movie. But hey, that's not a bad thing! Anyway, even if I'm not into sports, this movie still exceeded my expectations and managed to blow me away. The Japanese audience for this movie was 100% right. It deserves every penny it got. Too bad I can't say the same for the American audience since it didn't do well at the box office here. Anyway, I didn't want to say too much about this one simply because I want you guys to watch it for yourself and tell me what you think. But just know, I really loved it. We now have entered the top 10 for 2023. Elemental was the biggest surprise of 2023 for me. I didn't expect to really love it. The trailers didn't exactly sell me on this being a good movie, but I'm glad it bounced back at the box office. Elemental follows Ember, whose father runs a shop and he wants to pass it on to her when she grows up. One day, the pipes burst in the shop and Wade, who is Element City's inspector, has to report this back. Now, they are tasked with figuring out what caused the leak in the first place, while also growing an affection for one another. The movie does a lot right, and I appreciate that. I don't know why Pixar tried marketing Claude a lot. You could literally take him out of the movie and nothing would change. Elemental does come with a few issues I have, though. Like, it does do the third act breakup and the death fake-out scene, which does annoy me, and its third act breakup was completely unnecessary, since it sort of just comes out of nowhere. Ember learns throughout the film to control her temper, and Wade helps her throughout that in the movie. And honestly, I really enjoyed the comedy. The trailer didn't give the best first impressions on how the jokes would be, but I chuckled a few times. Yeah, I'm genuinely surprised I loved Elemental. It's not the best Pixar movie out there, but I still had a fun time with it. I also wish they did explore the world more since it felt more focused on the water and fire districts, and we don't see much of the earth and air districts. But yeah, go watch it. Before we end this section off, my friend Sabian had some things to say about this film. Let's see what those things are. What's up, guys? I'm going to talk about Elemental. Now, I'm notorious for being a bit of a modern Pixar hater, and Elemental didn't quite work for me, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, to say the least. Um, it was cute, um, but nowhere near one of the best Pixar movies, and probably pretty mid-tier. I would give it like 3 out of 5. Yahoo! I loved the Mario movie. I might get criticized for putting it this high up, but honestly, I really enjoyed it. It didn't need to be super big to be good because the Mario games are simple. Hell, Mario made up a good chunk of my childhood, 
And I play a lot of Mario games over on Liam Neeson, if you're interested to go check that out. Anyway, I do like they made Luigi to be like Peach in the games here. It makes sense given Mario and Luigi have that established sibling relationship. It'd be hard to have them get transported to the Mushroom Kingdom and Mario builds a relationship with Peach, then all of a sudden Bowser kidnaps her. Yeah, you get what I mean. I do love all the Mario references throughout the movie that are sprinkled in here, and the voice cast did a good job. It is Illumination's second best film, next to Despicable Me. Yeah, it's genuinely that good to me. I grew up with Mario and still play the games, so when a movie was first announced, I was really excited for it, and I'm glad the team delivered a great movie for fans. Would I say it's an objectively good movie in general? To be honest, yeah, I would. Everyone knows who Mario is, and this movie felt like Illumination was held at gunpoint by Nintendo to make this faithful. And, yeah, it's faithful for sure. And let's be real. If it was just Illumination who did this movie without Nintendo's help, it'd not be as good as it was. Hell, probably cringe. I wore my Mario costume to the movie and did this funny little thing. It's a me, Chris Pratt. Mario, you'll like this movie. If you don't, then I don't know, but Mario was great, man. I wonder what the upcoming sequel's gonna do. You could pull a lot from the Mario universe, so there are a lot of good ideas out there. Maybe they go to some of the Mario Kart locations that aren't Rainbow Road, which was a nice touch in this movie, even if I hate the track. Luckily, there's another person, hopefully, who thinks the same way I do with this movie. That someone is WH Dude. So, the Mario movie released a while ago now, and I'm here to do a quick review as to what I think of the movie. It was certainly better than I expected, I'll admit. With Illumination at the helm, I was worried it would have some definite rough spots. But honestly, I was surprised. I did give the movie an initial score somewhere in the 8 out of 10 range, and while with hindsight I think that might have been a bit high, it was still quite a good movie. It obviously wasn't the most groundbreaking movie ever, and I still stand by the fact that Chris Pratt could have leaned a bit more into something more than a slight variation of his own voice. I think nearly all of the other actors did a good job though, and I especially like Jack Black as Bowser. In fact, basically any scene with Bowser in it was my favorite for some reason. I'm also happy they made Peach an actual character and not someone who stands there waiting to get kidnapped and get rescued. I think there was a sort of invisible checklist for what a Mario movie could be, and they checked nearly all of the boxes. My only other complaint has to do with song choices, mainly that one deleted segment where they're driving in DK Jungle, because seriously, they had a perfectly good song for that, but instead they replaced it with Take On Me. I don't even hate that song, but the actual custom song for this segment is a way better fit. I guess they need to include a licensed song in this scene for some reason. I can already hear the comments on this video. Liam! Wh <laughs> Why do you love Wish? It's an awful nostalgia pandering movie that's a bad representation of the company's 100th year anniversary! But if you've seen my review prior to this video, you'd know I really loved Wish. And that opinion hasn't changed. I saw it three times in theaters, I'll buy it by accident, let me explain. I saw it on my own once, with my cousins another time, and then with my dad. While I do agree with the point that the Once Upon a Studio short is better, I don't know man, I love this movie. I love the way the animation looks. It especially looks good in 3D, which I believe is the best format to watch it in. Anyway, the story follows Asha, who wants to be the king's apprentice who grants wishes at selected times. Most of these wishes never get granted. And Asha is looking to expose the system and challenge the king named Magnifico, who is the best part of the movie. I like the songs, especially the reprise of This Wish and This Is The Thanks I Get. It references several Disney films strictly to the Disney animated canon. And I really like what they did with the end credits with it showing all the Disney movies over the years that leads to an old man playing the Disney song you hear at the beginning of most Disney films. Seriously, I don't get the hate for this movie. It does not deserve all the shit it's getting. While I agree with some points made about the film where the criticism stems from, but people are treating this as if it's Disney's worst. It certainly isn't, but if you love Disney as much as me, you'll have a fun time. If you're not a big fan of Disney, or a fan of the way Disney's doing things currently, you're probably not gonna like this movie. <coughs> Welcome back, Ghibli. After a string of, like, one really awful film and a serviceable film, 
Ghibli finally did it. It just shows they are capable of still making good movies. After Mahito loses his mother in a fire at the hospital, Mahito goes to a world where he meets a heron who shows him his mother is, in fact, still alive. Now he's on a quest with the heron to find his mother and find his way home. The thing that carries this movie the most above all else is its animation. I love the movie's animation. It is probably the best looking Ghibli film, period. Also, Wara Wara remains supreme above everyone else in this film. I appreciate this movie for not having any marketing whatsoever before the film's release, because trailers these days spoil a lot or are just flat out bad. I typically try to see movies blind if I can, and Miyazaki will always make a great movie. Although I do want to take the time and point out the fact that the film is called The Boy and the Heron, the title How Do You Live makes a lot more sense in my opinion, since that was the original title of the movie. Either way, it was a great time, and we'll always get excited for a Ghibli movie. Also, it won the Oscars, and let me just give my take on that real quick. It's really cool to see another anime movie win again. I mean, sure, anime movies have been nominated in the past, but the only one to ever win a said nomination was Spirited Away, which is another Ghibli movie. I thought all the nominees this year were a bunch of hydrogen bombs and no coughing babies in sight this year. All five of the nominees were solid. However, Robot Dreams won't be counted for this list since I go by a USA release date and it hasn't officially released here yet. Though I did go to an early screening of it and I do have a review on it, so go ahead and check that out if you wish. Anyway, yeah, congrats to the boy and the heron for winning. I personally thought Spider-Verse would win, but I was dead wrong. It's a brother! This is the best Netflix movie this year, period. I loved Nimona. Its animation is insanely creative. And I love Nimona going through the arc of being an entity who causes chaos to someone who redeems herself by the end. It's a story about acceptance and Ballister meets Nimona after he's exiled from the kingdom for allegedly killing the queen. He and Nimona go on a quest to prove his innocence and Nimona wanting to get accepted for who she is. Nimona can also turn into animals and I think that's very, very cool. It does do some things that stop it from being a truly perfect film, like the third act breakup, for example. But overall, it is a very fun movie. It has animation that knows how to express itself, and you can just tell a lot of heart went into this. I hate that Disney shuttered Blue Sky. They were robbed of this movie, and it deserved to be on the big screen. I bet they're crying about how successful this movie was, and they were wrong to shut the studio down. I'm glad Netflix picked it up and released it there, but yeah. The movie also has a twist villain which works within the story. I won't say too much about it. Just go watch it for yourself, man. <coughs> this movie was by far the most depressing thing I've seen all year. I teared up a bunch at this romance. And it is no rom-com. It is indeed a very emotional movie. The two leads, Azu and Karo, have really tragic backgrounds, and their motives are honestly really sad. Karu goes through an abusive household after his sister died and his parents divorced, and Anzu aspires to be a manga artist, and her backstory really hit. I won't say what it is here though, so if you do decide to watch it, it has more of an impact on you by the end of it. Anyway, the two discover a tunnel that supposedly will grant them anything they want, and they decide to conduct experiments on the tunnel, and they both have a wish that only the tunnel can grant. I did cry during the movie, and thought it was a very thought-provoking experience by the very end. I talked about the film a lot more in my review, so I suggest you go watch that if you want to know more. Spoiler free, but man, this was one tunnel I most certainly wanted to explore and never ever say goodbye to. One thing I alluded to a lot in my review is that this film does not hold back with how depressing it truly is. It pulls no punches and doesn't sugarcoat a thing. It really hits you where it hurts. The pacing was perfect. I genuinely don't know how they managed to tell the story in such a short runtime, but man did they make every scene count. Go see this beautiful piece of work and see if it will destroy you emotionally like it did with me. It's called the Tunnel of Summer to Exit of Goodbye. Well, fuck, I mean the Tunnel to Summer, the Exit of Goodbyes. And trust me, You'll cry so much watching it. Now go! What are you waiting for? I personally believe this is the best incarnation of the Ninja Turtles ever. It may not have the most heavy focus on action, but I like its focus on the teenager aspect rather than the ninja aspect. Don't get me wrong. 
The ninja aspect is still here, and is still good, but it mostly focuses on the dynamic between the four turtles. Leonardo is my favorite of the turtles, and always has been. Superfly is an excellent villain, and I sort of sympathized with him. Not that I agree with his goals or anything, but he was amazing. The movie is also hilarious, and its references do not feel forced in any way. The Mr. Beast cameo was funny as well. I was surprised they referenced Stewie Griffin of all things in a kid's movie, but it's something to appreciate. Paramount made a true banger with this one, and I'm really excited to see the sequel. Hopefully it keeps the same animation style as this one. I want more Spider-Verse inspired art styles or blending 2D and 3D together. I love how the goal at first for CG animated movies was realism, and now we got stuff like this going against that idea. Please continue to do more. In the next few years, animation can evolve even further from this if we try. My friend Najib got this movie in his country a week before I did. Let's see what he has to say. So around the beginning of the year, Liam asked me if I wanted to do a segment for his animated film ranking, and I thought, eh, why not? So I gladly accepted it. So yes, that's right. I'm in charge of this section. Anyways, I'll be want to admit that I've never been a big fan of the TMNT franchise. Not because I dislike it or anything. I just haven't really grew up with the franchise much personally. I have seen a couple episodes of Rise of the TMT a few years back, but that's really most of what I remember. And I got to say, after watching this, I can say that I'm pleasantly surprised by how great this interpretation of the turtles is. I've been loving the approach that a good chunk of animated movies have been taken recently by going for a more stylized art style that was inspired by Spider-Verse, and this movie is no exception to that. Its inspired animation style looks a lot more um, gritty and sketchy um, that makes it stand out a lot and helps some um, enhance the action scenes very well. It just looks so good. And putting aside the visuals, I just found the whole movie to be very charming and fun. I like how this time they um, actually brought in actual teen actors for the lead characters. It makes the writing for their chemistry alongside the fact that they're teenage turtles much more authentic to me. The story is also a lot of fun and well written despite some moments I feel like could have been developed better. The characters are easily likeable and yeah, that's about what I liked about in this movie. It's storytelling quality is not quite in the same level as something like the Spider-Verse movies or possibly The Last Wish or even the Lego movie, but it doesn't really need to be in my opinion. It's just a very fun, very charming and very enjoyable movie that I had a really good time with, with likeable characters and an amazing animation style. So yeah, uh, it's pretty great. Uh, I give it an 8 out of 10. Thank you for letting me do the section, Liam. I can hear the comment section once more on this video. You all probably expected this to be at the top of the list. And now as we speak, you're ripping me apart limb by limb or aiming a rifle at my head from the outside of my house. <laughs> Anyways, even if it's not at the top, it still is without a doubt one of my favorite films to come from this year in general. What it achieves is amazing, and it seems everyone agrees with that fact. It continues the story of Miles, but the true best part of the film to me was the spot. I truly love the way they wrote his character. Being honest, I'm very salty that there were no 3D showings at all for this film, because it honestly truly deserved to be shown in that format. Imagine how crazy the visuals on this film would go. We get introduced to a world of Spider-Men from all different universes, including a few familiar faces from the last movie. However, it's revealed the spider that bit Miles wasn't actually supposed to happen, and that he isn't supposed to be Spider-Man. This is all for the sake of a status quo that Miguel O'Hara placed after a tragic incident occurred where he also wanted to save everyone. The film ended on a cliffhanger, but I'm honestly okay with that. I love this movie, and I am very confident that Beyond the Spider-Verse will be my favorite movie of whatever year that comes out. Good god they went so hard. I don't respect how the animators were treated during the making of this film though, but as far as I know, that's just alleged, unless it's been confirmed by now. It's safe to say Phil Lord and Chris Miller are still pumping bangers, and I will always watch a movie with their names written on it. Everything about the original is upped here, including the animation. They up the stakes, and just words cannot describe this beautiful masterpiece. Surely I'm not the only one who thinks this way. It's been praised online for a reason, hasn't it? And yeah, who else could share the same thoughts I do more than my friend Charlie? Take it away, dude. So I have been requested by the great Officer Midnight Chopper to discuss... My personal favorite movie of all time, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. 
and I wish I had like a script or something, you know, that I had written before, but I'm just going to say immediately what comes to mind because I watched this movie 11 times in theaters, five times in IMAX, and it still never gets old. What I love about this movie is I get to watch it an infinite number of times and I still feel my eyes well up with tears. I still feel my, my, my chest, my heart go up to my throat, you know, with, with pure emotion. And the, the, the movie is beautiful. It, it, it is an absolute feat in animation. And, and it's absolutely stunning visually. But the real driving force of the movie are the characters and the narrative. And even though I'm a diehard Spider-Man fan, I love Spider-Man more than anything else in media. Even if this movie wasn't a Spider-Man movie and it had like the same story and characters, you know, just like rebranded to like a rack arachnokid or something i would still love it just as much it is a fantastic movie it is not only an amazing spider-man movie but it's an amazing movie and it stands for so much for animators in general you know 1000 strong artists it is an absolute feat not only in film not only in animation but in art as a whole it is a celebration of the medium yes yes best movie of 2023 best movie of all time I'd argue Suzume is the best Shinkai movie has made. It was an emotional adventure that follows Suzume who gets transported through a door that leads to another world. Oh, and there's a chair along for the adventure. She has to close every door with a key to prevent a world catalyst from occurring, all while her legal guardian is out looking for her. I think the film's animation is better than both Your Name and Weathering With You combined. I'm serious. The movie achieved that. We also have a cat whose goal is to be loved by Suzume. Does sound like a lot is going on in the movie, but it is handled very well. I talked more about it in my review, but everything about it was so perfect and I loved everything about it. While I love the two movies I mentioned just now, I think Suzume knocks them both out of the park. And I want more from this guy ASAP. <laughs> this movie quite literally nearly killed my hype for several movies after it came out. Or so I thought. It was the beginning of the year after all when it came out. However, I knew nothing was going to beat this masterpiece. Love is War is my second favorite anime of all time. I'm always on the edge of my seat during the show and scream, Ah shit, at every corner. This video here has become infamous within my friend group. I swear to god I'm out of breath right now. I'm at lots of words! That was awesome! Oh shit! Oh. Awesome series, really good movie. It follows the events of season 3 and shows how Kagi and Shirogane first started their relationship. And I felt for both of their characters. We get scenes of the other student council members, sure. But they are the stars here. Chika is my favorite character in the series, and you cannot make me change my mind. Hell, I even brought my plush of her to the theater. When the film was funny, it was fucking hilarious. And when it was serious, it was very emotion heavy. And when it was hype, well... Everyone in my theater went as crazy as I do. Watching this in a theater with so many fans like myself was a treat. Shame it couldn't be dubbed during its theatrical release. Though I did watch it when it hit Crunchyroll and dub. And it was still as amazing as the sub version. I really hope season 4 comes soon. And yes, for me, this is better than Spider-Verse and everything else that came out this year. Shoot me. It's so fucking good, man. Go watch the series, then watch this movie and tell me I'm not wrong. If you want to hear more, just go watch my review I made a while back. I crave for Love is War content, and it truly was a first kiss that never ends. However, we got one last cameo to go through. Take the stage, Nathan, and finish this ranking off strong. Now this a good movie. It's hard to praise this movie as much as I want to without going into spoiler territory. While this was premiered as a movie, in actuality, it's more so part of the series, not a spin-off. Meaning, in order to fully take in everything this movie has, you'd have to watch the three seasons that come before it. It sounds like a lot. It's so worth it. What I will say is that this part of the series, outside the manga, which I have not yet read, is at the very, very top. Which is saying a whole lot 
plot considering the breathtaking last track of season 3. This show continues to surpass itself each and every coming season. It itches every positive part of my brain and every element is grilled to perfection. I cannot stress enough, this is worth the whole watch. If you're into funny romance shows, it's... it's amazing. Yeah. So yeah, that was 2023. 2024's list may not be as big and hype as the list for 2023, since that brought in a bunch of hype animated movies people have been dying to see. I look forward for what holds for 2024, or the rest of it rather, but due to the writer's strikes, it sounds like we may not get a truckload of western animated movies. But I still have my anime movies and all the streaming releases, so tell me in the comments what you're most excited for for 2024. I'd love to know. And what was your personal best animated movie? I'm gonna guess right now that everybody in the comments section is gonna say Spider-Verse. But, however, I'd also like to give special thanks to everyone who was on board for cameoing in this video. And everybody else who was supposed to be in it, but just couldn't make it for one reason or another. Thank you. I wanted to make this video really ambitious due to how big of a year this was for animation. Thank you all for watching, and look forward to the rest of my content. I think this year will be a special year for my channel, as more OMC Movies content is on its way, and look forward for multiple reviews this year. Oh, and before we go, all the people who decided to cameo in this video or played a part in it, all of their channels and socials will be linked in the comments section. That is all. Bye everyone, and have a great day.